Okay guys, today we're going to talk about patellar instability. There are several causes of patellar instability. The most common is a non-contact twisting injury, although trauma is very common as well. You could understand how if you get hit on the medial aspect of the knee, um, this can drive the patella laterally to dislocate. There's some underlying causes, obviously trochlear dysplasia, a flat trochlea. You can see that here, that if it's real flat uh, and not sitting in a nice groove like this, um, that the patella would uh, be more easily uh, dislocatable. Um, a patella alta, which means a high riding patella, uh, we evaluate this using either the insole ratio, which we'll discuss in the next slide, um, but a general rule of thumb is if you look at a lateral knee x-ray, um, typically Blumensas line should be about the inferior pole of the patella uh, when the knee is flexed at 30 degrees. So. Um, even though this knee is not flexed to 30 degrees, it's, it's obvious that the uh, inferior pole of the patella there is quite a ways distance from Blumensas line, so uh, very high riding patella. Um, the perfect storm for uh, patellar instability is what we refer to as the miserable malalignment syndrome. This is a combination of femoral aniversion, a valgus knee, and an uh, external tibial torsion. So, if you kind of just take a minute and think about all those things, you can see how a, a valgus knee, an externally rotated tibia, and an anverted femur would all be risk factors for having the patella sit laterally. And if it sits laterally, it's more likely to dislocate laterally. Um, typically when the patients will come to you, they'll already have their patella relocated by the emergency department. Uh, just in the back of your mind, remember that when the patella relocates, um, that there could be an osteochondral fracture that occurs. Um, lastly, with a trochlear dysplasia, there's often a supratrochlear spur that kicks the patella out laterally during knee motion. So, uh, very important to evaluate your preoperative and as well as your intraoperative imaging um, to evaluate to see if there is that supratrochlear spur because if there is one, uh, it's going to continue to kick the patella out laterally and that needs to be addressed. Uh, how do we examine these patients? Obviously, they had a patella dislocation, so uh, we know that their medial patella femoral ligament, their MPFL, uh, is torn. The patella retinaculum is torn, so they will often have a large hemarthrosis if it's an acute injury. On evaluating patients, whether it's acute or chronic patella dislocators, uh, you really want to see how much you can translate the patella. Typically, you try to move it laterally. It should move about two quadrants or about half the width of the patella before you're, you're essentially stopped. In an acute injury, patients will be very apprehensive. They'll feel like it's gonna re-dislocate and they'll usually stop you before you even get that far. Um, in the chronic dislocators, uh, we typically look for what we evaluate as the J sign or refer to as the J sign. Uh, and this is just looking at where the patella sits as the knee goes from flexion to extension. Uh, when the knee is in full extension, uh, the patella often sits um, laterally. It pops out laterally. And when that person takes that knee into flexion at about 30 degrees, the patella will engage that trochlea and then uh, sit nice and centered like it should. So usually from 30 degrees of flexion beyond, um, it sits nice, but from zero, zero degrees uh, or full extension to 30 degrees of flexion, uh, the patella will pop out laterally. And that's a J sign. Um, again, for patella alta, we look at what we refer to as the insole ratio, and that's really just looking at the length of the patella tendon and the length of the patella itself. Uh, normal ratio is 0 0.8 to 1.2. Uh, if it's greater than 1.2, this suggests patella alta. If you do obtain a CT scan, um, you can evaluate what we refer to as the TTTG distance, and that stands for tibial tubercle trochlear groove distance. And on your axial cuts of your CT as you're scrolling down, you look for where the trochlear groove is the deepest and you draw a line there perpendicular to the posterior condyles of the femur. You continue to scroll down distally until you see the most prominent part of the tubercle and then draw that line. And that distance between the two is referred to as the TTTG. If the TTTG is greater than 20, um, uh, then this is a risk factor for patella dislocation. 
an easy question you're going to get asked regarding patellar instability is which ligament is injured and that's the MPFL. Um, it's important to note from 0 to 30 degrees of knee flexion, the MPFL is a primary restraint for uh, lateral translation of the patella. At about 30 degrees of knee flexion, the patella engages the trochlea and the primary restraint to lateral subluxation is really osseous at that point. If you do decide to do an MPFL reconstruction, um, you can almost guarantee to be asked about Shottle's point. Uh, there was a study that showed a reliable landmark for the femoral attachment of the medial patella femoral ligament. That's referred to as Shottle's point. And uh, the way we obtain it is you get a perfect lateral of the distal femur. You draw a line down the posterior aspect of the femur. You look at the posterior aspect of the femoral condyle, draw a line perpendicular to the first one. You look at the uh, uh, posterior aspect of Blumenslot's line, again draw a line perpendicular to the posterior one of the femur, and in between the two uh, is Shottle's point. That's the femoral attachment for the MPFL. <clears throat> uh, so what are our treatment options? It's not unreasonable for first-time dislocators to be managed uh, conservatively. Um, it is important to consider obtaining an MRI, really not to evaluate for the MPFL, which we know is injured, but really to evaluate for the presence of loose bodies that may need to be addressed. MPFL reconstruction is by far the most common procedure that's performed for patellar instability. Again, the idea is that you establish Shottle's point and then you reconstruct uh, the MPFL with either an autograph or an allograph. Um, you can also do a quadriceps turndown. Uh, so there's multiple ways of doing this. Um, if you did that CT scan and you looked at the TTTG and it was greater than 20 and you're considering doing something more than just an MPFL, um, then you would consider what's called a Fulkerson or or tibial tubercle osteotomy. And that's essentially uh, cutting the tibial tubercle and moving it. Uh, it's called an anteromedial uh, osteotomy, which means that we take that cut and we move it anterior as well as medial. Um, important to note is the angle at which you cut uh, the tibial tubercle. The more vertical you are, the more anteriorization you will get. So if someone has a large central patellar lesion, then you would want a more uh, vertical cut because you want to anterize um, the tubercle more. The more flat or horizontal you make the cut, the more medialization you'll get. So just know uh, what you're trying to achieve with your cut. Uh, lastly, a trochlear plasty. Um, is a very invasive procedure. This is typically reserved for significant causes, or I'm sorry, significant cases of trochlear dysplasia. Uh, something to keep in the back of your mind. A lateral release, uh, you want to evaluate for uh, the tilt of the patella. If it's tilted like this, uh, releasing that ligament there sometimes will bring that around. This is rarely, if ever, done by itself, but it is uh, often done in conjunction with either an MPFL reconstruction or a tibial tubercle osteotomy. Um, so just be mindful of that. I hope you learned something. Make sure to visit the website uh, to check out the rest of the videos we've been posting. Thanks for joining.